I've had a, some things happen in my lifetime, especially the last 25 years, that haven't been all that wonderful. And I, I would like to be able to share some experiences that would help one family or one person maybe not uh, have to undergo some of the things that have happened to me. There is hope. There is hope now. So. Twenty-five years ago, I was my it was my younger brother and I that were partners. We're taking over the farm at that time. He was suffering from alcoholism. Anybody that's worked with an alcoholic knows that you, a lot of times you can't trust them to to be on time to work or you'll discuss what needs to be done and they will forget. So it was a, a hard time for me at that time. We had tried to get him into some counseling and a mental health provider and his wife was an RN nurse and so she had really good insurance, but there was a question on whether they would cover the, the counseling and stuff that he, he needed. They sent him home for the weekend thinking, well, we'll get to see if the insurance would help pay for the counseling that he needed. And, and uh, over the weekend, uh, he uh, committed suicide. Um, and uh, it was our family's belief that had we got him into mental counseling earlier, we, we might have been able to save him. And my younger brother had two young kids. Uh, at the time that he committed suicide, he had a infant son and a two-year-old daughter and, and his wife. And so that was a sad, sad time. Before that, I, I thought I had the perfect life. You know, I was, you know, I was farming. I had a pretty wife. I had a, a nice house. I had everything that most people wanted and I had that. And, and, uh, and all of that came to an end all at once. My mom never learned how to drive, so everywhere they went, my, my dad took her. So they were always together. You know, they got along really good, you know. They had a, a you know, a good life. You know, my mom was a good cook. She was a good mother. She had cancer. Before we could take her to the hospital, we had to finish harvest. So my mom wouldn't go to the hospital until we finished harvest. So we, we got the harvest done. We had neighbors come and, and we had five combines cutting uh, our barley crop the last couple of days. And then mom would finally come to town and, uh, and she went into the hospital and she was failing fast. The doctor says uh, she probably won't make it through the night. Uh, so if you have any family members, you better call them. Please. So everybody came and, uh, and about uh, 2.30 in the morning, she started uh, recovering a little bit. And, and, and by 7.30 in the morning, she, she had uh, woke up and she was feeling good. And the doctor came in and he, he, he couldn't believe that she actually felt that good. And within uh, two days, they let her go home. And so for two months after that, my mom was able to uh, talk with her uh, children and grandchildren and friends and and in two months she, she had passed away. After she passed away the, the uh, 13 years or whatever that he lived alone, he, every day, every minute of every day, he wished that, that she was still there. For a guy who was supposed to be retired, he worked harder than the rest of us. Even the two days before he passed away, he had spent, you know, 12 hours on the tractor. So, and he was at 86. We had sold our crop of wheat to a, a flour mill in Lehigh, Utah. And uh, shortly after that, they had taken out bankruptcy. And so here we are with our whole crop down there. And, and now we're faced with no operating money but it was always in his mind that, how are we gonna survive this? You know, it was a sad time for us and, and it just kept eating on him, uh, bothering him. And all he was thinking of was the, the gloom and doom of uh, no money coming in for a wee and now our hay is uh, gonna get ruined or spoiled and, and, and uh, it just pulled him down. 
and has helped with failing a little bit, you know, at 86. And Monday morning he got up, he was a diabetic, and he wrote all of the numbers down in a book that he kept, what his levels were, and he'd packed his stuff ready to, to come back to the farm and go to work, and, and he committed suicide, you know. It was a horrible experience for my sister to, to find him. She struggled with that for a long time. Last year, for me personally, it was a it was a horrible year. Our winter wheat had failed. Um, we, we were having to replant everything. The the price of wheat was was coming down, uh, and I started going to the dark side of, of things. And uh, people could see it in me. People noticed that I had something going on and I had I'd got a pacemaker a year before um, and I was going back and forth to the cardiologist to, to get it tuned and every time I'd go back I'd, I'd ask them well can't we turn it up a little bit and you know I'd, I'd like a little more energy and they'd, they'd turn it up a little bit and I'd go back and I, I think I need a little bit more and so finally the physician's assistant whose name is Ariel, said, Scott, I think there's something else wrong other than your heart. I think, I think there's something else wrong going here. And, and I kind of explained, well, I think probably it's a little bit of depression going on here. And she says, I've got someone I want you to see, a dear friend of mine. And I was a little hesitant but she says, I'll make the appointment for you. I'll get you in. And her name is Kabai. And, and, and I went in for, for an appointment with her. Um, we started talking and, and she says, uh, I, we can help you, you know? And so she started going over the things that I could do to help myself out of this, this slump that I was in of uh, the depression and the, the the thoughts of suicide and and all of those things and, and so she says that well there's some medication and I thought no I'm not ready for that but, you know I, I was raised that you should just toughen up lots of people willing to have helped me if I would have opened up and and talked to them you know lots of people Each one of these plaques represent one of the, the young men that was involved in, uh, in a horrific accident uh, in 2005. They were on a, a field trip out to uh, uh, Blue Creek, Utah. They were out to the LDS church farm out there and they had gone out there to uh, look at the GPS system on their combine and, and uh, they were returning home from the field trip when the, the van had a rapid loss of air pressure on the left rear tire and when the, when the rim hit the, the asphalt or the, the cement, the, there was no way anybody could control what happened and, and the van uh, went off the road and all of these young men died the same day. This one was my son's. This represents uh, the GPS unit on top of the cab um, on the combine um, and my son was interested in uh, biofuels and stuff so this represents uh, his love for alternative fuels. It's on the side of it you can't hardly see it but it's the same thing that's written on his headstone it's, and it says gifted with the ability to, to read understand and remember. He had a photographic memory and he could read something and he could remember it. That's, that was a gift that I wished I had. From the time that he got out of diapers, he was with me at the farm all of the time. That was the criteria. Was you had, had to be out of diapers and then he, he, he could come with me for, for the summer. And I, I remember the, the day that I had to bring him back 
from the farm to go to school the next day, how, how bad I felt that I was, uh, couldn't have him with me anymore. But yeah, he could operate equipment. He, he drove my semis and stuff from the time he was about nine on. Sometimes he'd have to stand up to, to, to steer him and stuff, but he was a great kid. Had a really funny personality about him. It was pretty devastating up here for the university to, to lose this many students all at once. This many young, gifted people, all of them had a bright future in agriculture. All of them good young men, great teacher. It was a sad, sad time for a lot of people. After my uh, son passed away, um, I had the privilege of uh, being able to name uh, this soils lab after my son, Dusty Furman. As a, as a young man, he loved to play in the dirt when he was a child, and I was happy that we were able to, to name this soils lab after my son, Dusty. I hope everybody that's in here has a, you know, the opportunity to, to have a good education. Well, welcome to Pocatello Valley. Uh, this farm has been in our family for 121 years. I've spent most of my life out here. A, a beautiful valley, it's been really good to us. So. Uh, the way I've dealt with it, rather than having it be um, a negative in my life, I've tried to make it be a positive, and I, I've started a endowed scholarship for my son uh, so we can help uh, students in the future. So far we have helped over 40 young uh, students here at Utah State University in the College of Agriculture. I actually have one student who is uh, studying uh, violin up here and, uh, and I am helping her with her education also. So, uh, but I like to come up here and, and spend some time on a Sunday when it's um, peaceful and quiet and, and think about these young men that, and what they could have done. You are good, but it's not enough just to be good. You must be good for something. You must contribute good to the world. The world must be a better place for your presence. And the good that is, that is in you must spread to others. That's a quote from Gordon B. Hinckley. I was on my dad's obituary. It's not near as dark as you think it is at the time. It's not. Tomorrow will be a better day. Next month will be a better day. Next year will be a better year. It'll be better. <laughs>